Welcome to another edition of The Witch Hunt, coming to uh, a drug scandal near you. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, you can abuse us on social media like all your buddies at Off The Ball on Twitter, facebook.com forward slash off the ball or youtube.com forward slash off the ball as well as that. Um, I, I'd like to start with a complaint, right? And this is against Antonio Conte, who is doing his best to get sacked in advance of the game against Manchester United, which is completely unacceptable. We demand that Mourinho and Conte are on that same touchline pre-match, during the game and post-match and that we get lip readers who are uh, multilingual who will be able to instantly translate exactly what they're saying to each other. Maybe there's a Portuguese mafia that's far more ferocious than the Italian mafia and that's coming after Antonio Conte. He's like, well, I'm Italian, you've seen The Godfather, uh, this is going to come after you, Jose. And Jose's like, well, you've actually, you don't know about the Portuguese mafia because it's, it's well, like the worst crazy. thing that's ever existed and it's, it's going to take you down and maybe that's the reason here maybe Chelsea's just got some very powerful friends who are going to back him up when that fight eventually does happen Chelsea scraped a one-all draw last night with, uh, with Norwich in the yeah. cup before eventually going through on penalties mm-hmm. they should have like, done it an extra time have the team quit on him that's what I'm wondering I'm, I'm not sure if that's the case maybe they just don't care about the FA Cup which is a distinct level of possibility I mean, there's other Premier League teams such as Arsenal, you know, the upstanding club that is Arsenal having been knocked out at that stage. So I wouldn't necessarily tire Chelsea with that same brush. Um, they, sh- they should have been done an extra time. The VAR finally had its first moment of, hmm. This doesn't really work. Well, it wasn't even used from what I could see. Alan Shearer was like, oh, you know, I worked grand at the weekend, but I've always been suspicious of this thing. This technology, this newfangled idea. And uh, so that, that's him. He's writing it off on the back of one of the papers today because it didn't work particularly well. Yeah, the, the VAR has a mind of its own where it just kind of goes for a wander and is like, I'm going to screw up this game yeah. as badly as possible. I was off having a cup of tea. You'll find that uh, I couldn't actually uh, rule on whatever it was that they were supposed to rule on at that point. Um, so that was the big story from last night in the FA Cup. Two sendings off for Chelsea in extra time. Morata and Pedro both done for dives. Yeah, the second yellow anyway, done for dives. Uh, Willian as well received the yellow card for the VAR. I didn't actually see the full game, so I don't know what the other Well, it's way faster bedtime. Um, but I, I did see the Willian yellow card given for uh, for that dive over the VAR, which was, which was a joke of a call, really. It was a, The ref actually had a very, very good real-life human position to call that yellow card, or to call the penalty, rather. And he gave a yellow card and said, let alone uh, bringing in the VAR. So some some stupid human decisions is what I would put that down to. It's not robots destroying the FA Cup. Not yet, anyway, but I think Shearer might be onto something. I think robots will eventually take us over. The VAR will... Uh, I mean, it'll, it'll be robot off. football we're watching. If eSports ends up in the Olympics, like, immediately in the next one, then it will ultimately end up being robots that we're watching. Watched by robots and all human... Civilization is dead. Well, there's either that or the whole thing becomes inverted and robot civilization is like, actually, we need some human uh, references Fun. for this. We, we need, no, it'll, in, and there will be a historic moment in like a century where there will be HAR and robots are like, finally, we have uh, a human assisted referee and it's just one living human on planet Earth who was brought in as to make mistakes. The, the, the Premier League. Ah, uh, look, uh, that human. guy made a mistake. Yeah, exactly. That stupid human. And fun will exist. <laughs> this is a weird dystopian future we're thinking of. <laughs> well, I think that uh, that's been brought about by um, reading some of the social media that we've um, been attracting over the last while after the uh, Grobler story. We ended up talking to the IRFU yesterday. We got a uh, response from Munster to a bunch of questions that we've asked. Um, we would have said in a fairly calm manner, to be honest. Uh, but I don't think it's been received that way by the Munster fans who think that, um, sorry, some Munster fans who think that we're out to get them and that we're part of a witch hunt. Uh, apparently, that's the general consensus now. This, despite the fact that actually what we're trying to do is to protect the um, core of rugby from being poisoned by the notion that drugs are okay. Because if you look at athletics and if you look at cycling, you don't get it back. You get one chance at this, and if you don't start right, you don't get it back. Um, but we'll talk a bit, a bit more about that in the newspapers. And fair play to Chris Henry for coming out. Absolutely. And breaking ranks and saying it's, it's uh, what was his word? Unacceptable. Unacceptable, yeah, that's, that's one of the, the strongest words he uses. But I'm glad he pointed out that it is some Monster fans. I'm a Monster fan. I, I haven't joined this witch hunt yet. You haven't, I, I, might, I might join <laughs> you're, it eventually. You're wavering a bit. Donald Lenehan on my side as well. Myself and Donald Lenehan haven't joined the witch hunt just yet. We're the only two Monster fans who haven't done so. But, you know... If uh, if you slag off another one of our players, I, I'm afraid we're going to have to jump on board and say you should have covered this when he was eventually signed completely under the radar. We should have covered this 10 years ago when uh, Ulster had a player who apparently had um, a, a dodgy past and had, um, you know, what about? What about Ulster and what about all the other things? What about? Mm-hmm. What about? 
classic what about from sports fans um this is definitely one of my first experiences of this um but i guess the dublin the dublin fans were fairly similar in the aftermath of the comments that were made and anytime it comes up but i guess sports fans are just a little bit like this of it's course like, they're and why wouldn't they be i mean you will always want to defend your own yeah but even the we, dublin thing is a little has a little bit more rationale behind it even if it's not one of your own and it's like not really an attack on Munster, this is just the, yeah. this is the hierarchy. These are these are really poor decisions made by the hierarchy of a sport, and um, that's, that's I don't think it's comparable to the Dublin situation. That that's what, what I'm trying just to say. The, the outrage has been like, yeah. Uh, this is a, pretty much sums up uh, the Twitter notification stream at the moment. All right. Yeah. Well, that I mean, who's worse, the the EA Sports kids who were attacking you? EA Sports kids are the worst people that have ever existed. No, they're the worst. There is nothing you can do. They're the worst humans that have ever been created. <laughs> Like, there is no question. We're not even getting into this debate. The EA Sports kids that appeared on my timeline last week are just the worst. Did they not start out kind of fine and friendly and cuddly? Or and then they progressively got worse. Were there death threats? Not th there was actually... Okay, maybe not. There was, there was certain... I've never had to report people on Twitter up until this point, and I don't know why... Well, like, it's not even a laughing matter to that extent, because I, I just had to report them. There were certain <laughs> words that were used with my Twitter handle that I'm like... Imagine if somebody did a cross-reference on me in years to come, and there's this like twelve-year-old scumbag from the from I don't know whereabouts in the United Kingdom using these sort of words in the connection with my handle. I'm like, geez, I, I've literally been slandered left, right, and centre via twelve-year-olds. And fair play to them; they've uh, they they possibly could have destroyed my life if I'd uh, if I'd failed to report them. Who knows? All right, I, I didn't know that. What can? Well, you were you were on all the. I was like, oh, he was guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, wow, okay, that's, that's dark, that's, um, no, I, I, I won't bring it, but for the most part, they were kind of just stupid, and that was kind of funny, you know, the, the way they managed to buy into this with such passion. For anybody who doesn't know, we picked a, we picked a, Owen picked a FIFA EA sports team and didn't, didn't have Leo Messi in it because he doesn't really watch any football, draft. he doesn't have TV. Um, you and, took him. And so, <laughs> and so uh, uh, EA helpfully retweeted it to their six million followers, or was it the official six million, FIFA yeah. account, yeah. yeah. And um, and so he got attacked for not knowing anything about football for taking Messi and loads of other crappy decisions yeah, that, that he made that, along the way. That was that was fine and funny, but uh, yeah, let, let's let's just say that there was there were certain things. I think around uh, Friday night last week, I don't know, maybe the twelve year olds had had their first kind of pop or something, and they were like, "Oh, the sugar rush! Look at this idiot who didn't pick Lionel Messi." I'm going to pick the most scurrilous word I can uh, choose out of a dictionary. Um, how can but, you leave out Lionel Messi as David Moyer wanted to know? I mean, he, I mean, you're calling David Moyer a twelve year old kind of pop, but I think he's right. Well, I, think, yeah. I think he's got you there, Owen. I think he has. Why did you leave out Lionel Le Messi? But uh, the, anyway, they're worse than the Munster fans. Let's not, or the, the Munster fans who disagree with the Grobbler take, let's just say, they are, they are worse than them. Uh, we'll tell you what's coming up on the show. A really busy day for you here on Off The Ball AM this morning. We have loads of GAA, the uh, hurling and football coverage for Air Sports Allianz League coverage was launched yesterday. Um, Patrick Horgan and Lee Chin are going to be part of that. And... Um, we're going to hear from um, Alan Quinn a little bit later on. Going to pick our back row for the Six Nations squad. He's going to join us. We've uh, got our power rankings, which have been a little bit overshadowed by some of the other stuff that we've been covering on the show this week. We thought, oh, this would be good. People will talk about the, our, uh, our depth chart. But ultimately, we've all ended up talking about um, Gerbrandt Grobler a little bit too much this week, but uh, unfortunately, it has proven to be necessary day after day after day after day after day after day because the story keeps rolling. And I'm not really sure that much was done yesterday to kill the story. Um, Philip Brown and John Delaney happen to be in the same room getting grilled at the same time. One of the most bizarre... Uh, journalism experiences that I've ever had. So it's the biggest day in the relationship between the IRFU and the FAI because they've just announced two years early that they're doing another five years on the naming rights of the stadium and so it's massive amounts of extra cash for the IRFU and the FAI and um, all of the assembled journalists. So all of the um, Rugby writers were there and all of the football writers were there because Delaney and Brown were both available for comment. And this is obviously in the midst of one of the biggest football stories that we've had in about four years, really. Martin O'Neill contract, the Stoke situation, so Delaney's there. And it's probably, it feels like it's an even bigger story for whatever reason this week, the Grobbler thing, than Ireland not winning the Rugby World Cup, which is bizarre. Like, it, you know, it's um, a sub-second row who is on a one-year contract, massively overshadowed the announcement of 
a five-year multi-million euro deal for the IRFU and the announcement of the Six Nations squad. Like, it's weird. It's so strange. <laughs> and it, I think that's because they just didn't handle the story very well. If they come out and said, this was a mistake, it won't happen again, issued a three-line press release last week, everybody would have gone, okay, fair enough. Yeah, there, there certainly wouldn't have been the, the level of kind of targeting that needed to be done. Which, it, like, who was happier yesterday? Who, who do you think was like... John Delaney uh, was like, this is amazing. Go, man, Philip, thanks very much. Because, like, uh, so... They were literally being questioned by, it was supposed to be the Daily Press and the um, the Digital Rugby, so Daily Football and the Digital Rugby at the same time, but they're kind of like, so you, we're, your side of the desk and my side of the desk apart, the, 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 the two posses were kind of back to back, and at one point you could hear Emmett Malone talking loudly to John Delaney, hang on a second, just go back there on this, right, just go, go, back, go back a bit to that specific point about the contract, and Philip Brown is being asked questions about... Um, about Grobler at the same time. It's like, this is mental. Yeah. It's like a fun fair for uh, incredible stories that have just launched like grenades both at once. I mean, at least with O'Neill, there was like this third party that they didn't have any control of in Stoke. Like, the FAI and Martin O'Neill didn't really, they couldn't control the, the way that Stoke managed that story. But the IRFU and Munster are the same organization effectively. I mean, granted they have separate chief executives, but they're the same body. They're like, you ring them up and you go, what are you doing about that? Yeah, okay, no, we're gonna do this. That's what we're gonna do. That's our strategy here is we get out in front of this and we say this, 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 and this, and we don't deviate from that line. Of course, like they literally pay some of their players. It's like they are, they are of course, completely linked. And if Philip Brown went in there yesterday thinking that he might get off scot-free because of the fact that it's a monster problem, then I don't know wh what he's thinking, to be honest, because that was never going to be the case. But, like, I know we might be playing some video in a little while. Uh, you're saying John Delaney was the happier man as a result of the situational circumstances. Who, who played the better PR game yesterday? I think the FAI by a mile. Like, when you think about it, like, ultimately, Delaney has his, his manager in situ for the next campaign and that's like that's the situation as it was from before the Denmark game it's the situation as it is now at the end of all of this like that relationship maintains exactly the same as it is the IRFU say they didn't have a policy in place around the time of uh, the Grobler signing despite the fact in all their drugs policies they say we've got a zero tolerance policy to cheating so either you do or you don't which means they did have a policy in place they just ignored it but like the specifics of this case, the whole point about zero tolerance is like it means that we don't tolerate this cheating here, this cheating here. It's like a, it feeds all of the other things, <coughs> or else it's just empty rhetoric, and it turns out it's empty rhetoric and it's not true. Was one of the lines yesterday that they want to change the way we approach this drug policy, or that the policy needs to be looked at? Because that strikes me as not the correct thing to do here. It should be... We need to we go away and have a look this. at it. Yeah, we need to I look mean, at how we apply this policy rather than look at the policy itself. Well, if it's a no-tolerance policy, then that sounds like the best possible policy, no? It's the application of said policy that's the problem. Well, it's, it's, it's either open to interpretation or it isn't. Um, there's, a, there's a few um, different treatments of this in the newspapers. We may as well get into the newspapers and, and bring you through the headlines and play you those uh, videos. A, a couple of quick um, comments on the Philip Brown interview, which um, we'll get to. I'm a Munster fan and I agree that he shouldn't be there and he shouldn't be played, but your interview with Philip Brown was ridiculous. Didn't give him a chance to get his point across and purely tried to trip him up and get him to say the wrong thing rather than get his actual view and thinking behind the situation. That's not the case. We had a very short window to do those interviews and as you'll see if you've seen the video it's like effectively it's being wound up from pretty much the get-go the answers we'd already heard because he'd already given the precise exact same answers that long filibustering where it's like this is our drug policy we've had this in place for years we do this 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 and this we've got those uh, officers in the four provinces that's all completely irrelevant to the current situation with respect to the Grobler case the Grobler case is why this is a story right now and what the IRFU are doing about drug testing isn't actually specifically relevant to this because they're completely separate issues you're doing your drug testing thing you have to do that, otherwise you won't get any money from um, the state. That's just a, that's how this whole thing works. And you have to do it because that's the right thing to do. So you don't get bonus points for showing up and the postman doesn't get extra for delivering the mail. It's like, that's your job. You're supposed to do that. And so if we've got three and a half, four minutes to do an interview, I'm not going to try and 
have that time completely wasted. We need to get to the actual specifics of the issue. That's why we're trying to move it on. And that's why we'd like to have a much longer interview with Philip Brown at some point in the future, where if he wants to lay all that out and say that that's the context for this decision, then that's fine. We can debate that because I don't really believe that there is that context around this decision. This decision was a bad decision. It was a mistake. And they need to own that and say, that was a mistake, it shouldn't have happened, as opposed to, are you asking, would we make the same decision again? And that's not what we're asking. Did you make a mistake, is what we're asking. And it's like, yeah, okay, we did. And what's, I don't really understand, we made a mistake. Like, that's a mistake. Cheating, taking drugs isn't, isn't a mistake, by the way. This whole, oh, he made a mistake as a young man, that's all bollocks. I'm sorry, but like, that's like, yada, 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 you know. You cheated on purpose. You took a drug. You had to go and source it. You had to undergo that um, process where you take it, you get the benefits of it, and you're probably still getting benefits of it to, to this day, according to most recent science. So, anyway. Um, yeah, this, the, I, I do find the whole character references that have come up quite a bit regarding Grobbler as completely irrelevant. I'm, I'm not sure, like, should we be taking that sort of approach to every doper, but certainly he's a good guy, isn't a defence. Uh, morning lads on the way to Cork and then on to Kerry and then back to the big smoke says Ronan Horrigan who's uh, doing a bit of travelling today Ronan I hope the roads are safe for you out there Mark Connolly says I'm a Munster fan personally I'm delighted you focus on this and got both Munster Rugby and the IRFU on the record about how this decision was made it was a very poor decision in my view and I hope the IRFU policy will be amended to ensure this can't happen again that said I'd like to see the focus come off Grobler now he's done his time a zero tolerance approach to doping isn't a policy it's a principle the policies need to be more granular that's a fair point. I mean, it should inform all your policies, though. It should be like we're not going to hire any former dopers. And anybody who uh, fails a drugs test will get fired immediately and won't be invited back into the Irish rugby environment. Let's have a look at some of the back pages this morning. The Grobbler story being carried in pretty much all of them, and it's leading the way in the Irish Times in their Sports Thursday. IRFU knew of Grobbler's past when approving Munster deals, says Jerry Thornley's story. Chief Executive Brown says having policy of such players should be considered, and a five year extension of naming rights deal for Aviva Stadium is agreed up to 2023, which is a bit lower down the headlines than you'd expect uh, that the FAI and the IRFU were wanting as a result of this press conference yesterday. But what do they expect? Uh, and at the back of the Irish Independent, uh, uh, Grobler deal wrong, says Chris Henry, which is a very interesting line. Ulster and Ireland star says signing of Doper unacceptable. We'll get into a little bit more detail on that one with Alan Quinlan a little bit later, but it's certainly been the strongest voice from a player we've heard in this story so far. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the Mirror Sanchez, sale of the century. The details are beginning to emerge, and if the details are accurate, well, holy... Alexis Sanchez is the best agent in world football. And there's me thinking, just sit it out for another six months and you'll get all the money in the world. He's getting all the money in the world anyway. United will pay an incredible 182 million for Sanchez in four and a half year deal, 117 million guaranteed in wages, 35 million transfer evaluation, 10 million to the agent, which yeah, clearly he deserves every penny from Sanchez's perspective, and a 20 million quid signing on bonus. 20 million in cash on day one and 117 million over four and a half years. Thank you very much. I wonder, is it going to be, are we going to have a million pound per week player yeah. before 2020? Oh, totally, yeah. I mean, like, what was the last Messi deal? It must be pretty close to it. Yeah, quite close. Uh, he'd be the highest. He'd be the highest paid player in English football. So I think yeah. Messi just about edges him. 180 million deals says the uh, Herald. That's the same thing. Delaney, we can't stop Martin if he wants to go, but that's like you can't stop him. But it looks like he's committed to us. Um, uh, Mullen says shadow led to fatal fall. Is that? It's Nichols Canyon. Yeah. Um, uh, Willie Mullins is hoping that a shadow. Sorry, is hoping that a shadow before the final hurdle at Leopardstown over Christmas, which the trainer says led to Nick Canyon's fatal fall, will not be an issue at next month's Dublin Racing Festival. So that's a Johnny Ward story there. Uh, on the back of the Irish Daily Star, they're going with Schmidt and Martin O'Neill on the back page. Uh, Delaney's message to Martin reads the headline there. Also, is this our tab of the morning to you, the best pun of the morning? Vars, video referee chaos, as Chelsea squeezed through. I think that's... Uh, tab of the month to be quite honest with you I think that's a fantastic headline and uh, on the Irish Examiner it says Lansdowne agreements O'Neill 100% committed but I uh, can still consider offers says Delaney and no room for Zebo. but Schmidt calls up Larmer uh, and then I might just take a quick look at some of the UK back pages on the back of the Guardian rolling back the years reads the headline uh, as Wigan beat Bournemouth 3-0 last night reigniting memories of 2013 with Bournemouth scalp and they're going with the same thing on the front of the Delhi Telegraph sports section Cherry stunned by Lowly Wigan yeah, and then just finally for me now, it's £505,000. Alexis will become highest paid player in British football history, but Arsenal will KO the move unless they find a replacement. 
I mean, you'd be driving to Arsenal and pleading with Arsene Wenger to let you go, right? Five hundred, five grand a week. Yeah, but Mino Raiola is the other party in this, and he apparently wants Mkhitaryan to be the highest paid player at Arsenal. I mean, no. which is hilarious. No, <laughs> like so, the, this thing isn't done because it's not Mkhitaryan; it's Raiola who literally has the keys to this thing and could veto every penny of that 500k that Sanchez is just salivating over at the moment. So, as we said, it was a busy day at the uh, VV yesterday. Let's bring you some of the interaction that happened. We're going to uh, hear from John Delaney in conversation with Oshin in a moment. But first, here is the chief executive of the IRFU, Philip Brown. Yeah, the grassroots is obviously a big issue this week. People are, are concerned about the fact that Munster have hired someone who is a confessed doper. And there's been a, a series of questions, obviously, um, you personally have been involved with the anti-doping uh, within rugby from, for, for decades back now and reading your reports, the opening line from 2015-2016 was we've got a zero tolerance policy to this. That's not actually the case though, you don't have a zero tolerance policy if you hire somebody who is a cheat. Well, I think the first thing to do is to outline very clearly what the, the environment is here in Irish rugby. Uh, we are probably the most stringent country in the world in terms of rugby, in terms of anti-doping. So we why have, would you risk that? Well, uh, well, why would you risk that Let me just explain exactly how our, our system works. We've, uh, we operate with uh, Sport Ireland um, very closely. Um, we have over 70% of the user pay tests uh, are, are actually for rugby. Um, we target very carefully uh, who we test, uh, particularly at underage level, to ensure that we have players coming through the system uh, who are effectively clean. And that's now, great, Philip. The only uh, difficulty is that every sport in the world says they're the cleanest. Like Lance Armstrong never failed a drugs test famously, yeah, well, so drug me, testing if, is important. But uh, yeah, let me, let me just continue. If you let me continue, I'll, 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 I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll move it along. The, the, the situation um, in terms of uh, Grobler is uh, here's a young man, 20 years of age made a poor decision, uh, made a very poor decision. Uh, Do we know it was a poor decision? Do we know it was a decision that the team inflicted on Like, How much of, about the due diligence of the precise situation did we do? It's a poor decision and, they, the, the, and, and at the end of the day, he's 20 year old, he served his term, uh, he did his two years uh, and uh, he played in, with, uh, in France last year. This year, Munster had a crying need for a second role. Uh, this name came up and they made a decision to... Who made that decision? At the end of the day, Munster made that decision uh, in conjunction with the IRFU. So, so you the, and David Yusufora and Razi Rasmus? Decisions, decisions are made uh, through the, the high performance department in terms of the branches. If they wish to bring in a foreign player, they must consult with the high performance department. The high performance department then in discussions with the brand, province will decide okay. whether it, is, uh, it is, is appropriate or not. So, so you sign the, off on it? So the bottom, the bottom line is, the bottom line here is, is that the young man uh, is here for a year, uh, and at the end of the day, he's operating in a very different uh, uh, environment to that that he'd be working in in any other country, given the level of, t of testing that we do, and also the the the. the, the but why are you emphasis. poisoning the monster brand by bringing in a drug sheets? I don't understand that. Let me just continue. I think the emphasis that uh, we put on anti-doping in this country is is significant. We have four people working in one person in each province working uh, uh, in terms of our spirit program on anti-doping but this if you'd like me to explain I'll explain but, but why do you risk all that and just continue let me explain the 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 bottom line is is that the uh, we have uh, a medical system uh, we have uh, an anti-doping system we have an educational system all of which is geared to ensure that we have uh, a clean environment and a safe environment for players to play in. Now, in relation to and then the you Grobler, bring a cheat in, though. In relation to the Grobler situation, I think the the answer I think really is is well, firstly. Uh, there was no specific policy uh, at that particular time to deal with that particular set of circumstances. Did you talk about it? Did uh, you say this guy has tested positive for anabolic steroids, let's have a chat about it? I certainly that. didn't talk about it because that doesn't come to me, but at the end of the day I'm not ducking uh, the issue. The issue here is, is that something that we should or should not do? And I think that's a, uh, a, that's a valid question and it's a question that we have to take on board and I think it's something we have to consider. Should he play sure. over the course of the rest of the season? Uh, at the end of the day, the man is under a contract. He's a 20-year-old, uh, but he's not 20 years old now. But you but, could pay uh, that contract uh, up and, and make sure that he doesn't play. 
at this stage uh, the, the bottom line is he's on the roster in Munster he's playing with Munster I think the, the, I think the man should be given, given a chance to, to do what he is paid to do and to do uh, what, he, what, he, what he is entitled to do uh, in terms of uh, his, his, his chosen path and his chosen career even though it damages the, issue, the Munster brand okay, we're going to wrap this up now well, that's, okay. I think at the end of the day I think what we'll do is we'll obviously take on board the views that have been expressed both publicly and privately and uh, we'll obviously have to consider do we need a policy and how should we consider dealing with certain with that set of circumstances in the future philip thanks very much okay All right so that happened yesterday at the Aviva. We obviously had asked a bunch of questions of Munster and the IRFU, sent emails to both of them yesterday. We got a response from Munster yesterday afternoon to the specific questions. We may as well run through these. Um, so Philip Brown in the IRFU's anti-doping report in 2015-2016 says Irish rugby has a zero tolerance policy towards cheating in rugby. When did Munster's zero tolerance on drugs policy end? If it hasn't ended, how does it confess having a confessed drug sheet on your team tally with a zero tolerance policy. We're in line with Irish Rugby in this front and support a zero tolerance approach to doping in Irish Rugby. The ongoing tests, investment and structures in place support all efforts in ensuring rugby is a clean sport in Ireland. Next. Who in the organisation had final say off in the decision to offer uh, Garbrandt Grobler a contract? With the departure of three senior specialist locks at the end of the 2016-2017 season, Ryan Foley and Madigan, two of whom were internationally capped, Ryan and Foley. Long-term injury to Darren O'Shea and back row specialist Dave O'Callaghan, director of rugby Razzy Rasmus and the Munster Rugby Professional Game Board, identified Racing 92's Grobler as an eligible world-class player with a required skill set for top-flight rugby and offered the player a one-year contract. The Munster Rugby offer and contract was sanctioned by the IRFU, as are all contracts for international signings. Uh, apparently due diligence was done on Grobler's drug taking and apparently he was spoken to about his drug taking. Uh, all parties were aware of his admission of guilt to the use of a banned substance in 2014. The two year ban set out by the governing body and his eligible return to play professional rugby when signing for Racing in October uh, 2016. The decision to offer him a contract was based on requirement, character references, skill set and experience of playing at top level rugby. So that just to read that again, the decision to offer him was based on requirement, character references, skill set and experience of playing at top level rugby. It doesn't seem as if the um, two year ban was a negative at any point in that. It, there's no suggestion that uh, it gave them pause for thought. Uh, is there one more page or questions or was that it? So, uh, yes, yeah, so this is the last one. Oh, yeah, I guess this is, this is actually the, some of the, the meat of this. <clears throat> Do you accept that the standing of Munster in World Rugby is diminished by having a confessed cheat wear the jersey? Who takes responsibility for that? No, not at all. Munster Rugby is a people first organisation. The character references and recommendations from people we respect were paramount in our decision to recruit Gerbrandt from Racing for the 2017-2018 season. Secondly, his ability to contribute to the squad was similarly confirmed by those who have previously worked with him. Based on our assessment of the player's suitability and the knowledge he had international clearance from World Rugby, Munster Rugby were satisfied to give Gerbrandt the opportunity to continue his chosen career as he moved on from Racing. 92. We support his inclusion in our squad and at this stage he has represented Munster in the preseason game against Worcester Warriors in August and most recently lined out for Munster A against Nottingham in the BNI Cup. So they're going to continue to play him is the implication from that because why the hell wouldn't they? They've already played him. And then this one, uh, what's the message to the members of the Munster Academy about drug use when there's someone who used drugs in the first team squad? Do you accept that there are mixed signals there? There are no mixed messages internally. As an organisation, Munster Rugby's stance on doping is in line with Irish Rugby and World Rugby and we support and action all efforts in ensuring and promoting a drug-free sport. All agree, including the player himself, that what he did in 2014 was wrong. He is an example to others, in particular our younger players, as to why you should not dope in sport. He nearly threw away his career because of a bad decision he made. Garbrandt's experience is a deterrent to any young player in our system. And then this last bit, which I'll just read, but then I'll go back to that line because it's important. Munster Rugby have fantastic support staff in place for players who come through our development system, and they're in place to educate players on supplement use and our food-first approach. But just to go back, right? Garbrandt is an example to others, in particular our younger players, as to why you should not dope in sport. He nearly threw away his career because of a bad decision he made. His experience is a deterrent to any young player in our system. It's not. It's not a deterrent. That's just not credible. And that's what the issue here is. That if you want rugby to become like athletics, if you want rugby to become like cycling, where people watch it and go, oh, that's a kind of exciting thing over there in the corner, but that it means nothing ultimately because you can't believe what you see, then fair enough. And that's the path that comes from employing people 
who have this type of past and saying, oh, he's, he's, served his, he's served his time. And sure, no one's ever tested positive in our system. The best athletes and the best cyclists never test positive. They just don't because testing doesn't work. Uh, the, the drugs that people have access to and the money that they can spend on drugs just means that drug testing does not work in any sport. So uh, if you're going to start taking players from South Africa, because that was the implication from some of the stuff that uh, Philip Brown was saying yesterday, that he's coming from a, a very different system than the system he's going to be here, then you just open yourself up to all sorts of questions. And I maintain the well of Irish rugby is being poisoned because we are now willing to say, yeah, that's fine. Irish money, Irish investment can be spent on players who have a past which involves cheating. Luke uh, Fitzgerald made the point that sport isn't real life. You don't automatically get a second chance. Like, he can go off and become a teacher or a surgeon or uh, he can work in a mine, he can drive a taxi, he can become a lawyer, he can become a doctor, whatever the hell he wants to do. That's his second chance in life. But like, why do you actually get a second chance and why do you get a second chance in Ireland? I don't know. Uh, it, like he would have got a second chance elsewhere, it's like us providing the second chance. It's clearly just been the nobody's problem for the entire thing and I guess it still goes back to, I, I just don't understand how people who c call themselves the biggest Munster rugby fans at all because invariably they are the people who respect this tradition of Munster, respect the values of Munster, this well that is being poisoned. These are the people that respect why the, this poisoning could matter. These are the people that are most vociferous about this being a bad witch hunt uh, against Gurbank Grobler. I would have thought those people are people who would value that the most, people who are the most anti-dopers. Uh, who care the, the most about the Munster and Irish Precisely. Brand. Like I, um, I, I know before this thing came up and kind of away from more serious stories like this, th there is almost kind of... Uh, a taking the piss notion out of the whole Munster tradition. I, I buy into it, but a lot of people are like, oh, it's, it's a lot of nonsense, it, it, it doesn't actually mean anything. But those people who buy into what some people perceive to be bullshit are the people who are coming back this week and saying, he's not poisoning the well, this doesn't matter, move on, you should have covered it months ago, etc., etc., which I just find to be a complete double standard. Uh, Mark Connolly says, I'm a Munster fan. Personally, I'm delighted you focus on this. Got both Munster Rugby and the IRFU on the record about how this decision was made. It was a very poor decision, and I hope the IRFU policy will be amended to ensure that this can't happen again. So I read that one earlier. Um, so one mistake in your career is gone, says Owen Murphy. What happened to second chances? He served his ban. Grant, if, you, if you're happy enough that this guy is representing you and your culture and your club, whatever that is, uh, from Corcon to Gary Owen to Shannon to whatever, if you think that that tradition is best represented by allowing people who have um, cheated in the past to come in and be part of your culture. That's fine, that's on you, but you can't get that back and uh, you can spare us the, the bullshit then about this being something special and more than a club and all that stuff, because it isn't, uh, if, if that's what you're going to do. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see whether the reaction is the same when the first 19 to 20 year, 20 year old Irish lad has a positive test. We should make a policy that if you test positive, you get fired and you don't get a second chance in Ireland. Go off and play for one of those premiership teams who don't care, who are run as businesses to try and make cash, and that's all they're interested in. But, like, no, I would say Irish rugby should have a policy that if a 19 or 20 year old tests positive, they know exactly what the rules are. They know exactly what, the, as uh, Philip Brown pointed out, they have a really good education system. But just say, no, that's not our culture. We're not, we're not South Africa. We're not going to take people back. Mm. Yeah, it, like the, the the other thing that has been uh, trotted out a lot over the last week is this idea that would you be reacting the same way if it was an Irish player? And for yes. the reasons you just outlined there, of course he would. The it, it'd be worse. It would be, but I I also think that the fact that he isn't an Irish player is an, a very important aspect of all of this because it is the importing of a player, it is the scouting of a player and bringing it in, it is the active uh, recruitment of a player who is a doper. Like that's a very important facet in all of this, and of course we will be reacting the same way if it was an Irish player. But essentially, the nationality thing does matter here as well because it's recruitment. It's it does diminish the monster value completely. It's an aggravating factor. Exactly. You, you've sought this out, and and um, I think uh, Gavin Comiskey was pointing out dopers come cheaper, so maybe this was actually just a financial decision, and that's point, like yeah. that's even worse. Uh, Peter Scully says drug cheats need a lifetime ban. Simples set the ultimate example. As a massive sports fan, I would prefer to lose clean than win dirty. Win at all costs is going to have the biggest cost of all. Ruination of kids, sport, and reputation of any game. Continue the witch hunt, he says. It's not a witch hunt. Definitely not a witch hunt. But, uh, you know, look, this has damaged our relationship with a bunch of people. Um, 
and ultimately it means that we won't be able to get access to people who we would like to be able to talk to about their careers and what's going on. And, you know, if that's the case, fair enough. But uh, it has to be done. Like, we, we can't, can't phone this crap in. If you want crap coverage, uh, well, you know exactly where to get it. Right, where to? I think we're going to move on to yeah, the other thing that happened yesterday at the yeah. Aviva. This was like, you know, because like, like... a fun fair. Like, seriously, the chief sports writers were kind of wandering between the conversation with Delaney and then wandering over to, oh, Jesus, I'm going to have a busy afternoon today. So, yeah, John Delaney um, and Oshin Langan, here's how the conversation went. Um, in, in our opinion, Martin is very loyal. He's been very open to us in terms of, of, of approaches that have been made over the previous four years. No question about that. And uh, I'll go back to the events here in November. It obviously took some time after to, to, to consider... Um, the manner of defeat, you know, um, obviously under, you know, it was a difficult, difficult night for Irish football, for the fans, for everybody involved in the game. But our next game wasn't until the end of March, and he took some time. He was in contact to say he wanted to take some time. Um, well, he rang me on Saturday to say that that's, he was going to meet Stoke on Sunday, which he did. Um, I believe it was a far better financial offer. But he rang me after to say he had respectfully declined our offer, and he wanted to stay managing the Republic of Ireland. And he came in last night, agreed terms. His representatives will be in town on Monday in Dublin and uh, there will be a contract signed prior to the draw on Wednesday. And I appreciate we're going to hear from Martin next week. Has not qualifying for, for the World Cup been damaging to the FAI? Are the things that you wanted to do that you know can't do, are there potentially even job losses on the cards? Has it had any effect? No, we've actually employed more, uh, a number of, of, of development officers in, in, um, in a couple of areas since the, the, the playoffs. Um, but, but the biggest um, disappointment of, of not winning uh, against Denmark is not going to a major tournament. You want the national team to be going to major tournaments. We saw, we saw the, um, the positivity and the expectation when we were going to France uh, after we qualified. It was a great tournament. We did really well under Martin's um, management. We got to the last 16, only beaten by France, as we know, 2-1. So you want to qualify for major tournaments. But what you have to do now is regroup, regroup. Um, the draws next week, uh, obviously, for the Nations League. Uh, Martin has indicated that he wants to bring in some younger players, which he will do. And uh, let's let's get on with it. When we go to Turkey, let, let's see what younger players he's going to bring in. And let's uh, ensure that for Euro 2020, that we give ourselves the best opportunity to qualify. Yeah, uh, it's very important to remember it's not going to be that hard to qualify for the Euros. I mean, obviously, it'll be hard comparatively. We're not a great team, don't have... Uh, a team festooned with superstars. But some of those games are going to be in Dublin. They now have longevity. They know exactly what's going to happen. You would expect Keane and O'Neill, O'Neill and Keane to both stay for the duration of the next qualifying campaign. Can we all move on? I, like, are, this, are the f- Irish football fans going to be booing Martin O'Neill? I don't think they are. No. I, uh, as the story's developed a little bit more, the more I've come around to the idea that this is football. That's, that's sport. You know, the politics happen. Like job offers come and go. Martin O'Neill is at uh, coming towards the end of a, a long and illustrious career, and he wants probably wants one more good go in the Premier League. And good luck to him if he had taken this and stuff like that. And I know that's probably going against basic human values of I don't know uh, verbal agreements and stuff like that that you would actually go out and speak to a Premier League club. But I'm just like this is football. This is this is the world we live in. And as you say, let's all just move on. Like this this whole thing though as well of the. The experimentation that might be able to happen over the next year, or so I'm not. I'm not sure. Do I quite buy that? I mean, this. It is easier to qualify for Euro 2020 than literally any other competition we've ever tried to qualify for before. But uh, like in the in the back of everybody's minds, is is still the Denmark 5-1, and it's still the potential that this this could perceivably go wrong. Like there is about, I would say we've got a 70-30 chance of qualifying for Euro 2020. I mean, and I, as long as there's a 30% chance that we won't qualify, that's going to be in the back of everybody's minds. Maybe not within the squad, but I, I, I'm certainly not going to be putting any of my money down on the fact. I don't, you can't actually get markets on it, but I'm not going to be putting any money down on the fact that, they, that they're going to be no, that they're going to be like throwing caution to the wind and giving debuts left, right, and centre. I think to, they will. He said that in that. Um, they might do in the friendlies, but not in the Nations League. Yeah. We'll, th- we'll see. I mean, I don't know if everybody's going to take the Nations League as seriously as you are on. I Honestly, w- wait till you actually read the rules of this Nations League and well, you realise that it actually That has. was a point that uh, Martin O'Neill made in that piece that he did with the uh, FAI TV the other day. It was like, it's competition that, you know, I don't know, I can't remember the specific words, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but roughly it was like, it's competition that, uh, you know, not many people are that familiar with exactly how it works. Precisely, Martin, exactly. 
I just, I just accidentally threw my pen across the studio there in uh, just a yeah. state of excitement you're, that yeah. somebody else understands what I'm going through here. Channeling your inner Eamon Dunphy. The Nations League is relatively important. It is. No, I'm not drawing a pen again. Uh, as uh, Tommy is saying in my ear, I could uh, take somebody's eye out. Uh, okay, quickly, two more uh, comments to get to. Niall Daly McGrath says, very disappointed. Sorry, Neve Daly McGrath says, very disappointed with the ongoing media negative bias reporting on this. Not all frightened, injured 21-year-olds make good decisions. It wasn't a year-on-year -year abuse situation. How do you know? How do you know? He's done interviews with people who have like, gone, oh, isn't it terrible that you've done this thing? Like, how do you know? Anyway, he owned up immediately and served all penalties handed down. This is turning into bullying. Please be mindful, he is still a young man away from his family. He's a professional athlete, 25 years of age, who is um, getting some consequences for having cheated. Like, there have to be consequences for cheating. We can't be like, oh my God, it's terrible. Like, imagine that there's consequences for cheating. Like, anyway, how can anti-doping in South Africa people say to the young kids that taking drugs will negatively affect your chances of getting a pro contract in Europe when Irish teams, and even the Irish teams, are hiring dopers, says Kevin. This isn't a witch hunt. Witches don't exist. Dopers do. Let's move on to uh, GAA. It's a good point about the witches not existing, actually. Yeah, was, like what a, is, a line will be stealing here, Kevin. What is the end game of a witch hunt? You throw them in the water, and if they float, they're a witch, so you kill them. And if they don't float, you're like, oh, Jesus, sorry, we've drowned you. Yeah, Grobler's a, a heavy man. You <laughs> definitely think he's not a witch. He's not a witch, and this is not a witch hunt. All right. Oshin was down at Air HQ yesterday. He was a very busy man after uh, talking to John Delaney there. He ended up at Air HQ as they launched their schedule for the coverage of the National League. They're going to be showing 17 live games over the spring. We're going to hear from Killian O'Connor and Patrick Horgan in a moment. But first, Lee Chin spoke to Oshin about what the Wexford hurlers learned from the 2017 season. We look at our overall year. Um, I think, um, obviously, you revert back to a couple of things that would have went didn't go your way. Um, in 2017 with the Galway game and um, the tip game in the, in the, in the league semi-final and in the Waterford game you would look at those three games that we were beaten in but also you'd look at back at the whole year where you, where you I suppose won certain games and you'd, you'd learn from them again of what you could have done better learn what you did and, and try to perfect it even more um, so yeah, it's a collective thing that you, you don't just pinpoint one one negative thing like a loss and say no, that this is where we're going to learn a lot from. We, we we generally look over a whole year and what we what we done last year. If you can tell me, and I appreciate maybe you can't, maybe you're sworn to secrecy. Um, is there any kind of common thing in those three games you mentioned that you lost that you can pick up on that you can learn from? Um, I, I've put many questions to Davy about systems. He insists I still haven't cracked years. Yes, he, he insists. No one has, to be fair. Uh, but if there's something you can tell us, please do. No, oh, I think it's. It's just pretty simple, you know. We 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 just didn't perform well in certain certain stages of the games that we had, like with the Tipperary game. We competed with them, we played well within what we tried to do, and um, it's just look. Our game plan does evolve around everybody um, buying into it and everybody playing uh, their role. And if there's two or three guys maybe that are after game, or if if one or two things go wrong, that they drop their heads. That's where the, everything kind of falls down around us. But you know. This year again is another year where we've learned to deal with all those kind of things, and you know, hopefully this year will be a more of a consistent level of performances and a consistent level throughout the game. Um, you know, so yeah, it's it's just pretty much in those games that we felt maybe there was one or two things that certain players might have done or didn't do that maybe affected their confidence and you know might have dropped the head for five or ten minutes, and then as a result of that, certain things fall down around them and. Look, I just think this year is something that we've been working on with that in terms of uh, things will go wrong in games, but you just got to deal with them just like life and like anything else. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what impact the second season of Davey is going to have on that Wexford team. Um, last year's Leinster Hurling final, one of the best sporting occasions of the year, which is not something that we've been able to say for about two decades. Do you mean about like the competitive spectacle in the field? Well, the fact that 60,000 people showed up. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought you meant. Because like, on the field it was a game for, what, 50 minutes? Yeah. Grand. It's grand, yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't say it was one of the best matches of the year, though. But I know, I know you meant spectacle now, though. Clarified that. Thanks, Tom. Just like not, not going to let yourself down there in that regard. Here's uh, Cork's Patrick Horgan talking about the loss of Kieran Kingston as manager. Unbelievable surprise, yeah. Um, like with the progress that we made, like you know, together as a, a team and a management for the last for the two years previous, like you know, was can't even describe the the difference it was. But like having gotten that far in. 
like he just if he could have went I know he would have so uh, that's just it like he had to go because he'd work and all that but at the same time you know John was selector last year like he's seen all we had to do all what we had to do preparing for games and all that and you know he's been manager of plenty of teams himself and um, you know he's well able and like we're really enjoying our training at the moment now as well and uh, you know it's, it's just nice preparing for the Kilkenny game now but when there is a change like that does it create a bit of uncertainty maybe shake the confidence a little bit no because as I like we know like our players know like that we go train and like it's up to us to get the best out of ourselves like you know what I mean so when we're there get the most out of it and like obviously it was it was disappointing to lose Karen like at the time and it is like but you know John was there as well like and you know at, like, we're, we're in now like a month or two with John, uh, John and his team and same physical coach as we always had and you know it's like nothing has changed like we're still training hard working hard on, on how we can get better on percentages and you know how we can get more over ourselves and it's going well like we're all enjoying the hurling That sounds good that a lot of the same backroom team are there obviously The Rock yeah, is yeah. gone and Kieran are gone but a lot of the same guys are there Yeah and it's the same physical coach you know and Fraggy, Fraggy Murphy is in with uh, doing the, the coaching so you know, we've, we've great fellas with us like, and uh, we're delighted to have them like, so we just need to push on now and uh, give as much to every session as we can for them like, and get ourselves better at the same time. I didn't know Fraggy was involved. They, they know how to use their resources well down in Cork. Yeah. Once, uh, once one leaves, they'll get another genius in. I, uh, I stupidly traded um, Fraggy Antonio Brown at the start of the uh, fantasy NFL season. So that, that was a smart move. In our dynasty league. Okay, and Dynasty may save it a little bit, but still, he went kind of the greatest, to do. greatest uh, season the receiver was ever having until he got injured for the last three games. I would have won the league. Anyway. Not, not bitter or anything? No, I uh, don't. Fair play to him. Um, I, I, like, the progress the Cork made last season was absolutely crazy. Mm. And so you really hope that they're able to maintain that because there is some continuity in terms of the management structure, but obviously, a selector, they want to do their own things. and. Sometimes you do your own things straight away and you make those changes to make sure that everybody understands it's your team. And sometimes people come in and don't change that much and they maintain what they had up to that point. So, like, Cork re-emerging last year was definitely one of the stories of the summer. And it would be great to have a proper Cork again. That's the thing. As long as they don't r- regress. Well, like, that's, I'm a little bit sceptical about how much they're going to progress this year because with Kingston last year, it was just such a smooth upward curve. Like, no, nothing spectacular in the league. Started off and first game of the championship, we're like, hold on a minute, are they back? And then by the end of the Munster Championship, they're like, Cork are back. Yeah, and, and they'd found some new players as well. But in the league, there was a couple of league games where they were a bit, there was a second half performance, particularly one game. And um, I just remember the interview, Kingston coming out afterwards and he looked shell shocked going. Mm. I don't know what's going on here, you know? Yeah, yeah. And then, like, I think they might have scraped a win or had a narrow defeat the next week, and it was like, okay, actually, you know what? And stuff turned around for them. Yeah, I'm just, I can't even remember the details of the league, but, I, like, they weren't unlucky against Waterford. Waterford deserved to beat them, but they were still in contention. They, were, they went shoulder to shoulder with, Cork for, for, with Waterford for 60 minutes. Yeah. I, I just, like, obviously having Myler in, that, that backroom team is a key component of why he is the right man, man for this job now, but... I just hope he's able to continue that uh, upward curve because they're so important to a great summer of uh, championship hurling. Let's get on to uh, Killian O'Connor of Mayo. He's saying that he can't obsess over the small margins and in particular over missed freeze. I can't speak for the manager, but, but I, I don't think anybody's obsessing. You know, I don't think I don't think there's any point obsessing on any part of your game or any opponent, let alone you know Dublin. They won it. They won it in 2017, but like it could be any of good few counties could be the winners next year so if you get caught up with one team you get caught up by different teams and um, you know there's, there's plenty of other teams that cause that pose all sorts of threats for us as well that, that we need to be ready for in the league and beyond so um, no I think it's just it's nearly the same thing we don't do the exact same thing but it's it's a constant drive for little nuggets you can add on to your game every time and um, hopefully we can keep doing that and, 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 and get, get to the level we want to what about you personally? Do you obsess over moments like like that free? Yeah, I uh, know. I don't. No, I don't. I, I was just saying. I review review the game as quick as I can afterwards. You know, um, I think that's 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 what I like to do. Other players might be different in their approach. Um, I think while it's fresh in your mind and your memory, you want to kind of take the lessons from it, take the positives that you can from our performance, your personal performance throughout that game and throughout the year myself, um, and then then like I said then you're into the downtime and that's when you switch off so I didn't want it lingering over me into the winter so 
I um, took what I needed uh, in the immediate aftermath and then I went about resting and recovering and, and switching off. Yeah, I hope he does uh, actually get to switch off and, um, you know, find peace with the Miss Freeze. That's interesting the way he manages or the way he kind of aims to look back on things immediately, as quickly as possible. Like, we, we spoke about uh, Mikko last week locking himself into the room after 82 and not leaving for ages and not being at peace with that for decades, really. He's still not at peace with it. And with Killian, does it, uh, he didn't say he's at peace with it, but certainly the, the ability to go and look at uh, just a bitter day like that was last year, uh, like, as soon as possible, just... If Dublin do five in a row, does that uh, magnify the 82 defeat again? Does it reopen the old wounds? Because then, obviously, they're the greatest team of all time. It's well, a, if they do seven, a, seven of nine, maybe then. No, five in a row. If they do five in a row. Well, seven it's uh, arguable. Well, it, it will be seven of nine wanted if it's five in a row wanted. But um, I'm trying to work out the maths in my head. It's not really an argument. It it no, it's, no, it's, it's not. Argument. Five in a row would be an you're, argument. It's just With a backdoor system where teams can actually get, lose a game and come back. You're, you're going on a witch hunt right now of my tendency to explode when I get angry about uh, Kerry football. So, no, of course, there will always be an argument, except for now, because that Kerry team is obviously the best of all time. Um, Okay, so it clearly would reopen all wounds. Was the is the answer? To yes, that. very much so. <laughs> like I, I would just be, I, I don't know, like in, in agony. Really, it would, it would be awful. It'd be a bad day for. I would, I would then get on the split Dublin in four or five bandwagon at that point, and like anything but this. Sean Hennessy says, "Why are journalists appointed calling for Martin O'Neill to be denied a new contract? The man was right to talk to a club in the best league in the world, albeit Stoke, who are struggling. I think we can count ourselves lucky because we were caught in the hop, and who would we have replaced him with?" I mean, there's a bit of merit in that. Like, people in football, like, talk to people about jobs. People in jobs talk to other people about jobs. Yeah, pretty much. Like, there, there is literally pawn swapping going on at the moment in the Premier League with, like, Olivier Giroud and Aubameyang being traded and Sanchez and uh, Mkhitaryan being traded. Like, th there is literally human bartering going on. Yeah, that's Pieces football. Of meat. That's football. That's yeah. just the way it is. Like, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, nah. This is awful. How dare he? And now I'm like, actually, you know what? Screw it. Like, who cares? And the fact that he came back and turned down more money. Yeah, that's a, like that. It's not like a positive. That's definitely a big thumbs up. I mean, okay, so it could be spin. We don't know, but that's what that's what Delaney said yesterday. Anyway, yeah. so we'd have to take him at his word. Uh, I don't know why he would say that. Yeah, if that would, wasn't the truth. Exactly. Yeah, because so I mean, it, it, it would be. And it, like, of course, it's true. Of course, Stoke are going to offer you more cash mm. than you're getting from. It's just a harder respect. job, though, I suppose, isn't it? Well. Hard, not harder, but certainly more day-to-day, -day, more ruthless, more relentless than uh, the, the Ireland job. So he probably thought, you know, euro per day of stress is probably worth it with the Republic of Ireland, whereas there's more, uh, more days of unbelievable stress when you're down at the bottom of the Premier League. Um. <laughs> Another good witch hunt comment coming in there. That's the, that nervous laugh. No, no, it was just... Uh just various bits and pieces uh, coming through at Off The Ball on Twitter or you can get us um, on facebook.com forward slash Off The Ball. Keep your comments rolling in for us here. Uh, what time do you wake up, lads, to be in the office? At least you can get a scoop in early later, says uh, Morris. Try January, Morris, right? Yeah, absolutely. I've uh, stayed dry now for whatever it is, 18 days now. It's been amazing. I can feel my pulse again. I feel like a real human. Uh, all right. We're going to talk rugby next, uh, turning our attention now to... Um, yeah, okay, so we're turning our attention back to rugby. Alan Quillen is outside, and uh, to set the scene, we're going to start with a little bit more Philip Brown. I think the man should be given uh, given a chance to to do what he is paid to do and to do uh, what he what he, what he is entitled to do uh, in terms of uh, his 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 chosen path and his chosen career. Even though it damages the, issue, the monster brand. Okay, we're going to wrap this up now. Well, that's. Okay. I think at the end of the day, I think what we'll do is we'll obviously take on board the views that have been expressed both publicly and privately and uh, we'll obviously have to consider do we need a policy and how should we consider dealing with certain with that set of circumstances in the future yeah so he's going to play alan quillen just walked in and said you're the devil you are the devil yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did that happen because you uh, started this conversation last week about gerbrand grobler um I, I was away obviously so people yeah, are probably <laughs> people yeah it's ironic i was away when this came out um Obviously, people are looking for my opinion, and, and, and people have been sending me messages and texting me and tweeting me and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a, a very difficult one, first of all, to get kind of get your head around that monster signed the guy in the first place. And genuinely, that was my thought straight away. Um, 
why did they sign him? Uh, I think it was a mistake to sign him because, not because of the playing ability uh, and the character and the type of guy or whatever he is. Um, I think they made a mistake because this was inevitably going to come up at some stage. Now, part of me thinks it should have come up in July. Okay, the lines was on. Uh, there was distraction from the rugby journalists. Can I just ask you about that, right? Shouldn't Munster have brought it up in the first point? Because I went back and looked at the press release. Probably. And it's like... What uh, would you do, though, if you were Munster well, in so that they, situation? They, they sent it would out... Would you have been kind of... Um, would you be... Would you had that... Would you have made that decision at the time or would you kind of hoped in some ways... I think they hoped in some ways it would go under the radar. 100%. Yeah. They, yeah. they press released it on the Friday, I think of the second test or the third test in the middle of the lines. Um, Look at the middle of the, the before the third test. I but think. But to be fair, Ger, uh, we will get onto it in a little bit more in a second. There was nobody available. They'd lost Dave Foley, Donica Ryan, John Madigan, uh, Darren O'Shea had an injury. As they say in their statement, Tyburn was was signed, and Tyburn was signed maybe two or three months before. So they knew Tyburn was coming 14, 15 months yeah. before. Uh, you and know, I'd say they hoped they'd get Tyburn released. And, and to be honest, I'd be trying to keep up on all the players throughout the world: who's available, who's not, who's out of contract. And you know, when I was a player, I was always saying, "Try and sign this guy." I heard he's out of contract next year, and you'd hear little whispers of guys keen and moving South Africans, Australians. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about, oh God, this guy stopped the development of, of a monster player. That's rubbish. There was no one available. Uh, the next person probably in line of a young player, now I'll have to clarify that, Finneen Witcherly, outstanding young player, who's, he's not European standard yet. He's an outstanding player, really good player, but... The counter argument is they've done all right without him. Given yeah, but if yeah, of soccer. course they've done all right without him. And then there's another argument: win at all costs, and who cares, and all that stuff. But if Munster are not qualifying for quarterfinals, they haven't. They're not get, making money. They're not keeping the brand up. They're not being able to reinvest. Um, they played two two back rows against Cast in round one in Europe, and a lot of their problems um, in the first part of the season were lack of second rows. Um, Jean Klein was injured. Um, they had to sign Mark Flanagan from Saracen, so they had problems there. And I know myself as a back row, if you haven't two good se second rows, like I was blessed, O'Connell, yeah. O'Callaghan, uh, Mick O'Driscoll, these guys, Dunica Ryan, four internationals. So that was an area that was of, a, of an issue. So if you're sitting down trying to fill those areas, you've got to look outside. There was no one readily available. So the fact that he's blocking someone else's pathway um, is not right. The moral side of this is this guy knowingly uh, took steroids in 2004 as a 21-year-old, as an adult, not a child. Exactly. Very young now, in fairness, very young. The temptation is there, and, and I put myself in the position, and I heard Dar speaking about it, Woody, Donald Lenahan, I, I was trying to follow all this stuff um, as ex-players. And, and any athlete who's in that situation, you want to try and make it, play international rugby, there's money in it, there's financial rewards, so there's temptations there. Um, this guy obviously, you know, he says he ha was injured. I don't know Gerbrand Grobler. I, I kind of walked past him a few times down in Limerick, um, didn't speak to him. Um, I suppose he, he made a bad decision to, to go down that road. The moral side of it is, um, two years is what you get for a, for a doping ban. Um, the policy in the IRFU uh, is zero tolerance on, on, on doping in, in rugby. Allegedly. And in, in, in our country, in the it country. Isn't really yeah, it's not a written rule again. So morally... They just bent that rule, like the first, the first time they needed somebody, they just bent the rule and said, we don't care about that rule actually. Somebody along the way went, wow, that's all box. But is zero tolerance, what does zero tolerance in rugby mean? Does it mean... Don't sign a doper. Does it mean that though? I, that's how I would pick up zero shouldn't, tolerance. Shouldn't it mean that? It probably should, yeah, it should. And, and they um, should know that, because like, it's, it's their policy. So they come out and they beat the drum about how great they are about like, uh, clean sport and we're mad into it and we've got this investment. There's, there's an individual officer in each of the provinces, you know, or spirit officers or whatever they were called. And it's like, it's nonsense. If you're, yeah. it, so just to go back to the story, right, because it's, it's interesting that like, the media are the ones who are being attacked for saying, my concern here is that rugby ends up like cycling or like athletics. And we love rugby, it means something. Munster means something, it's a powerful thing. And it means my whole life, I played 15 years there and I always think um, if you're a player in any position in Munster or Leinster or any of the provinces and if an overseas player is signed, 
is he going to come to my position? Is he going to be like when Jim Williams was signed for Munster? What was my first reaction? Where does that leave me? Yeah. Some Australian guy is coming in. He's going to take my place. It's difficult, um, and that's what you get get your head around. But then suddenly, if we, we don't have that situation now, where Gerbrand Grobler's come in and taking an Irish guy's place, no, so and we have so, to be realistic here. No, that, that's fine. But um, I actually think. That but morally, this the story of taking drugs, coming back, and one of the provinces signing. It would have been much better if we kept this squeaky clean that here we are, we have this zero tolerance, but we're not going to sign someone. We're sorry. We wish him well. We, you know, let us some other club sign him. The mitigating factors are there was nobody else there. But I think in hindsight, if this situation happened again, if somebody presented themselves, there's not a chance we'll sign another person in this situation. Part of me does feel sorry for the player because he's kind of thrown under the bus around this. This is down to, uh, you know, the decision makers. So the player served the band. Um, any athlete who, you know, we can all have an opinion on it, but the rules are there. It's a two-year ban. Yeah. So you don't think, do you think someone should come back after any sort of doping in any sport? I think that you, you have to stand for something. The, the rugby culture in Ireland has to stand for something. Okay, and so aside from that, do you think any any athlete in any sport, whether it be athletics, cycling, rugby, soccer, I don't think if a two-year ban dope, is, is enough. Do you okay. So they got to change that then. So we can't. But I think that we need to be leaders in that, and as opposed to going. Yeah, no, you, you're, so, you, you may be right. No, it's like that. these are the rules, and we're going to bend them as far as we possibly can. Is one attitude, or it's like we stand for something, and what we stand for is we want to win clean. And you know what? If if other countries are going to cheat us constantly, we're going to call them out on that, and we're going to expose that, and we're going to say that's not that's not acceptable. Yeah. But like. So we've tainted that situation. No. I, I think, yeah, we have. I think there's a possibility that this taints everything that's gone in the past. And that taints everything that goes in the future. That like, we, we you you were supposed to stand for something. That Munster jersey meant something for years and decades. Like all the way back, it means something. But I think that whoever made this call blew that up and went. Actually, that's all. That's, that's just marketing. The truth is, we need to win, and we need to win. No, I don't. Guy. I don't think it went down to. Oh, look, we'll try and make. Everybody sat in a room and said, "Say nothing. We'll slip this under the radar." I think it looks like that. Yeah. It, it, it didn't, that didn't happen, Ger. I think what happened here was uh, an error of judgment and Rassi signed him. Um, and I think... With Saiso from the IRFU and Rassi... Yeah, they have. sign off on the overseas players. They do. Um, that would suggest Rassi that... Rassi signed him and I'm sure he pushed hard to get him because there was nobody else because he's a good player. Um, I'm sure he's great. So it's Rassi Ra uh, and Rassi is gone. And I feel sorry for Van Grand. I feel sorry for Van Grand. I feel sorry for Peter Murray. Stuff, I feel yeah. sorry for Peter Murray. They're, they're, they're the guys who have to be rolled out. and, um, and They're the ones who all think that we're out to get them, but we're not. We're like we're actually trying to protect the Munster. Yeah, I, understand, I understand it now that I'm on the outside. I do understand it. Um, should the guy be play for Munster, be allowed to play for Munster? I think so now. Because I don't think you can go and say, well, hold on a minute, we've made a mistake, rip up the guy's contract and don't play him. I think it's too late. I think the decision that was made uh, to sign the player was wrong. He shouldn't have been signed. And what they if should they, have said, look, there's a problem here. This guy, we, we, it's going to... What if they win a European Cup and he's on the field at the end? Does that not taint that victory forever? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, I don't think, um, it does, because this is not going to go away, unfortunately. If he comes on on Sunday, um, I think the fans and the supporters and the diehards in Munster will support him. It's interesting that Rugby Players Ireland have come out and supported him as well. And, and I think they have no choice. A players agents, a players union they, they, has they to... They have a choice. They have a choice, Ger, because you, as a player, you, you, make a, you, si you sign up at the start of the year and you make a... It's a small nominal fee to be a member, mm. um, and they are there to support. So you can kind of just go, well, we'll throw the players under the bus if they've a drink problem or if they do something off the field. They're there to support them and off on field and off field stuff. So they've got to stick with the guy yeah. and give him some support. Um, any chance of redemption? You see, this is this is part there is, of there me. Is, there is there is definitely a chance of redemption. Who gave you the drugs? How much did they cost? How many of your teammates were using them? Uh, how did you administer them? What other drugs were available for you? And like chapter and verse, detail. And, Here's and maybe my diary come out and educate people on... on like, there's a 100% chance yeah, of redemption. Yeah. Like absolutely there is a chance for redemption. We put and the if he did that, do you think week. then it'd be okay I, for him to absolutely. play then for Munster? Abs and would that, I think, I think would that, that take like away... A, I think that you've got to... If he decides that he's going to dedicate 
part of his life to being a solution to this problem and becomes a proper cautionary tale. Because we're being told, oh, he's now a deterrent for the young lads in, in Munster and Irish rugby. But he's not. He's like, go off for he's two years. He's got to speak out about it now, you say. And become a leader on it. But can like, Munster become a leading area in this? Like, if we take what you say is true, that they actually didn't just put that much thought into it and they signed him without really looking into his background or kind of brushing it off, that suggests to me that Munster aren't in a position to be the leading voice in anti-doping. They said they got character references and, and talked to a bunch there of people. There were pretty brief that. answers in that, in that question and answer. It was like, did you, did you cross-reference the answer? It was yes. That was, that was one of the answers to, that, to our list of questions yesterday. So that there's, not, there's not a whole pile of detail there. Just on the premise that, like, we, we don't know, but if, if it had just kind of slipped through the cracks a little bit, let, let's say that that's true, that just strikes me as an organisation that don't have anti-doping high up their priority list and might not now be in a position to lead the anti-doping. Well, to be fair, I think, uh, I think there's just... There's a blip and a mistake made here. When I played with Munster, we, we were regularly informed about the do's and don'ts, the medications, our doctors were top class. Um, even around supplements and around, I remember it's probably 2004 or five, uh, we, were, we, we wanted to take supplements because every, all the other professional sides were. Um, and I remember we had Dr. Liam Hennessy was in with us one time and uh, he was encouraging us to take, eat more nuts, seeds, fruit, and <laughs> Trevor Hogan at the time. Uh, Trevor was trying to get a bit bigger because he was trying to get it in the mix with O'Connell, O'Callaghan, O'Driscoll. Um, he and Trevor ended up going to Leinster after that. But he could not believe that that's where we were getting nuts and seeds and we were expected to win in Europe. Um, now, obviously supplements have been introduced to all the provinces in, in a very measured and tailored way. Um, with, with our nutritionists and all that stuff. Um, so we continuously got loads of information. And to be fair on, week after week, any sort of changes in the regulations, any substances added to the ban list, medications, Lemsips, Sudafets, we continuously got that. So I think the information and um, that was given to, and is still given and uh, to all the players, professional players in Ireland. So the policy, I, I, so I, t I, I do feel a little bit that Munster just caught, got, got blindsided here, made a bad error of judgment out of panic that they needed someone. And the person who made that decision and drove that situation was Rassi Erasmus, um, who was doing, and you, you think of the year they're after coming off uh, with, with, with Axel, with the, the in terrible, uh, the adversity they've had and the job Rassi had done to bring him so far. So he'd, his standing had gone up to here. So he'd become a real kind of important, powerful decision maker. Somebody, some, there has a check, checks and balances along the way. The chief executive goes, I'm giving this contract to this guy. He's a drug cheats. Not really good for the brand. Sponsors aren't going to like this. I think that's the this. problem, Ger. That's the problem. The conversation wasn't had. He's a drugs cheat in a room with people to say, and then we hold on a minute. They now we they make did a talk decision. About it. They said that they were aware of it. They were aware of it. They like, were aware of it. I was aware of it when they signed him. I, I watched him for Rassing. I oh, I covered a game for Sky, two games for Sky last year. I knew this guy was had 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 tested positive for, yeah. for steroids. So I, I knew that, so. And the other, just a, the last couple of points on this, um, the whole point is that steroids train your body in a way that you can then get the benefit from them even when you're not taking them. So like, that's why I think there'll be an asterisk beside whatever he achieves in the rest of his career. It's like that guy dope took steroids and anabolic steroids help you get big muscles. You can then activate those muscles with certain training patterns. You don't need to continue taking them to get the benefits from them. That's a bad thing, and I think that's not fully understood by well, people. Uh, yeah, it's not understood by me that if you take steroids that you can... You get benefits for the, um, like, up to a decade afterwards. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not 100% sure on that, but obviously if you... That's what the latest you, science is. If you get bigger and stronger, that maybe you can maintain that strength. You lose some of it because yeah. it's, a, it's a quick surge of of strength and power, but obviously you, you build a foundation, so. Like clearly, you know, he was obviously really good because even after two years out, he's like now played with two of the best teams in Europe, with Rassing and Munster. Yeah, and So there's, the, the there's worries about his career, do you know, that's hard to buy. That's a sob story that, that you tell. He's, he's, he's signed the heads of agreement with Gloucester for, for a three year contract. Um, but you wonder why Rassing would let him go as well, like, so. As part of the Dunica deal, is it? Yeah. Have you, uh, so. It's anyway. a hard one to take when you see Dunica Ryan playing for Racing at the weekend and like, all this seriously? stuff coming out. Yeah, you know, it is. Yeah, it's very frustrating. The I, I just couldn't get in my head around watching Dunica Ryan in the Racing jersey playing against the red forward, jersey. Like yeah. Five minutes left to yeah. go, looking yeah. fit as a whippet. But look, um, I think the players should be allowed to play. 
at the end of the season, if they cut him loose, fine. But I think at this stage now, um, the conversation has been had. And credit to yourself and credit to the other journalists. But, but I like. Um, I don't think there's, I genuinely don't think there's a, a witch. I don't think it's a witch hunt here to enhance people. I think it's it's it was a very very important topic that was brought up. Now I think there's mitigating factors in in what happened and them signing him. They shouldn't. He shouldn't have been signed. There, maybe for months there are, but there's none for the RFU. No, I think they should have blocked it. Um, but look, it's a mistake. I think the conversation has been had. I don't think it's going to happen again. So just to finish in this point, yeah, I th- I don't think he should have been signed, but I think he should be allowed to play now. It's too late just to rip up the guy's contract. Um, but I would love to hear him come out and, and maybe that will be something that Munster will allow um, to have a conversation with yourself or somebody in the media to bring this out in the open, to have a proper conversation to say, look, this is what I feel about it now. This is what I was thinking at the time. And this is what I want to happen for the future. That I, I want to be part of, of change or, or stopping the situation. It definitely raises questions about uh, doping in South Africa generally. Like, there well, We always heard that, Ger, as we were players. I went down there to tour in, uh, and I know a group of the lads, I was on the extended squad in 98, and we had heard stuff. You know, we'd seen, and there was evidence. There's evidence to say some of the international players, top players in South Africa, have been have dr- have had serious drug bans. That there is possibly a culture there. There is evidence that in the, some of the school systems that there was uh, massive amounts uh, of kids in schools kids are taking them, taking it, and they're taking um, them to look. And there were surveys done about that in yeah. South Africa, and guys spoke out um, uh, about that. Young players, but there's in 2003 we went down there. 2004 we went down there, and again you're hearing these rumors, and you're looking at some of these guys, and you're thinking. Um, you know, they can do it all right. in secret, though, can't they? Right. And have the long-term benefits, as Jarrah says, and I suppose do it away in in, in their own and, and, and remote and people, locations. People have questioned: um, Is there a drugs problem in Irish rugby? All I can say again, and some people laugh at this, I haven't seen it. And I think, in fairness to the IRFU, they've tainted the situation now. But I think the testing. Um, I've I've often been tested when I was play, playing outside a ro- out and off off season, if you like. I remember being in a hotel in Cork and down in Inchidani one summer, getting tested there. Nice. Giving your, giving your dates when you're going on your holidays, um, they're calling to your house, stuff like that. Yeah. So it did ramp up as the years went on. In the earlier days, we were, it was after matches, but then we were fair game all year round. Um, so I think the IRFU, this thing has tainted the situation a bit. It's been a mistake, um, but I think the players should be allowed to play now. We're um, we're doing the Munster Cast game live on the radio on um, Sunday. Will Dave and Keith Wood have um, rotten tomatoes thrown at them in the commentary box in Thomond? No, I think people understand. I think even the diehards in Munster understand that this is uh, this this situation could have been avoided, but. Are you telling me if he goes out onto the field and, and gets a bonus point try at the weekend that people will jeer him or boo him off? No, they won't. I do believe in redemption in any part of life. And, I do, but and, you have to ask for it properly. Like, you yeah. know, like but to be fair to the guy, he's still, he, he, I think there is a situation now where he probably has to come out and speak about it and, and hopefully that will happen. It'd be great if Rassi was still here because he could go through the nits and, and yeah. The nuts and bolts of it. Why don't you try and get him on the phone or chase him down and see what he's speaking about? Not a bad shout. We've, we've literally asked everybody else to talk to us, so we, we may no, as well. I think Rassi, and, and to be fair, he's an honest guy. He's a straight guy from what I got to know of him, and I think he would probably tell you his views. And, and The reason this all kicked off from our perspective was that I, was, I said this before, we, we were doing a road show and it was in Munster, and there was a bunch of Munster players at it. And afterwards, the topic of Chili Boy Ralapelle came up, and one of your former teammates went, "That guy's a cheat," and he was really animated about it, like really, like that, you're going out playing against that guy, and he has taken drugs, like he was absolutely livid about it. And I remembered him saying that, and thought, "That's now your team. That still, it's always going to be your team and your club that has somebody who's been injected into the mix, who you have to say the same thing about." Yeah, he's it, you know I was just looking up what Chili Boy took. It was uh, methylhexanamine. Um, it's a steroid as well. Hexanamine. That is that with Toulouse. He or was in South Africa or was it? I think he it was, plays for Toulouse, but I think he played for Toulouse. He's gone now. He's gone yeah, back to South Africa. Yeah, I think he might have been um, somewhere else. Yeah, it was in South Africa. And that was while he was recovering he from injury. So. You know a bit about that's a con- that that could very much be got from a contaminated protein source. That's. Uh, uh, an excuse, that's often, excuse. Yeah, that's an, an excuse. How often do we hear sports people admit to it? 
You remember Marion Jones, the unbelievable oh, yeah. sprinter? Yeah, yeah. So she won five medals in Sydney. Yeah. Seven years. And the only reason she admitted to it was because she was going to jail. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take Ben Johnson to admit it? Uh, quite a while. A long time as well. So we've seen. So we have to give some credit if they hold their hands up. And, and I, I was kind of Googling this morning. You look at Martin... Uh, um, Martin Fagan, the retired marathon runner in Ireland yeah, yeah. from Mullingar. Yeah. Um, you know, he came out and admitted as well and spoke about it. And tried to get back into athletics and Irish athletics and then gave it up. He got back after two years. Yeah. He, there was a lot of pressure there and did shun him. So, um, and then he just, he gave, he gave it up. He stopped then, he retired. So, um, if they're caught and they admit it, there is to be a little bit of credit, a little bit of credit for that. I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you Because most like of them just deny it. But like, you but like you say, we then want to hear the story as to Chapter how, verse. the why, yeah. and what should and shouldn't be, and what the benefits were. Yeah, give us name names. what was going through your head, and say, like, where did you get it? And, yeah. and, and try and, yeah, that, that in turn then gives you a chance to go after where this, where this was sourced. Was this a, a program that was running? Was this a doctor that administrated? Did you buy it in the local gym? Yeah, come on, that's exactly the question you know, that needs to be being asked here. As because opposed we know to we've, it's grand, he's we've all time. heard all our lives about the bodybuilders and the gyms, yeah. and you know, sometimes these guys openly admit. Yeah. I've met bodybuilders who've, you know, oh, to totally, me, yeah, it's, no a, it's a massive it's, culture in, in Irish gyms as uh, well. Where so. does it come from? Yeah, um, the games themselves. Finally, get to talk about some rugby this week. <laughs> you kind of have forgotten that there's a uh, massive amounts of games of significant importance. Um, the Munster Cast game, there's the Irish matches highlighted there in the Champions Cup. Uh, Leinster at Montpellier, Munster on Sunday at home to Cast and Ulster away at Wasps. Um, are Leinster going to win this game? Um, it's going to be tricky. Um, Montpellier are effectively gone, um, but I still think they'll be very, very tough at home. Um, I think Leinster can go there and win, yeah, definitely. It's going to be a tricky one for them. Um, they've stuttered a little bit in France. You think of the cast last year when they went and got the draw. Yeah. Cost themselves probably getting top of the pool, uh, top of the whole seedings. Um, I think they can and probably will go in there and win. And do they, like, because they're qualified and because they have a home quarter final, do they care that much about finishing? Like, does, it do, he, Leo Cullen will want them to go and, and continue that, that that momentum and that that feel good factor they've been outstanding and they've sent out a real message that um, they're major contenders and if you think Saracens and Toulon the kind of big hitters when we get to knockout stages might may not be there and then you're trying to pick teams and, and look at who who will be there yeah um, last week when he named the team and picked Larmer um, we had Dave and Brian O'Driscoll in and they were both saying, oh, Larmer's getting picked here ahead of Rob Kearney. Dave was like, there's not a chance Rob Kearney doesn't start the game uh, in Montpellier. He's definitely going to pick him for that away match. Like, that would have been in, in Cullen's head. Like, you're, you're picking not one team, but two teams in advance. But now they're already through. It's like, that, that game last week when they got the bonus point and guaranteed, maybe that was actually a bigger game than this one. And maybe... So who's first choice? Um, I think Rob Kearney is still first choice when it comes down to the... Um, you know, the real intense, competitive, aggressive, physical games. Um, this guy's only played for start with his debut four months ago. So I think he has to be managed a little bit, yeah. um, held back a small bit. Now, he could be unique where you can just unleash him and he can just go from strength to strength to strength. I was interesting reading, uh, listening to Ger Gervin Dempsey about how much effort and work and enthusiasm he has, mm. um, the amount of video work and the extra training he does. Um, is fantastic to hear because that's what you want a young player. You think um, when they're doing that so young, um, but he's obviously learning off people around him that this is the required kind of level that you, you're not taking it for granted. You still got to work hard and analyze. Um, so he has to be watched. So I think Rob Carney is probably, and, and it's probably, it's going to come down to Joe Schmidt in Paris. Will he start Larmer at fullback? Will he start Andrew Conway? Will he start Rob Carney? I think he'll start Rob Carney. Rob Carney was really good in November. Yeah. He's tried and tested in Six Nations he about winning. Him. So I'm not sure what Leo Cullen's going to do, but he probably has to be fair to Rob Kearney as well. And he's a perfect situation, Leo, now in most positions where he can make changes. And, and the team isn't what's, What kind of a Rob Kearney is he going to get on Sunday, or Saturday if he starts him? The one who kicks drop goals in the halfway line. Well, the one who's, who knows now that if he has to keep this level very high, 
and that it keeps him on his toes as well, you know. So we'll wait and see on that one. It's a perfect time for Larmour to be developing, though, isn't it? When you've got even just Fergus McFadden to one side and you've got Ethan Asawa in front of you, there is sort of, I'm not going to say a comfort blanket because it's high stakes Champions Cup rugby, but still you look around and you're like, right, okay, there's experience to my left and right in front of me. And even in training, learning from the likes of Rob Carney is surely a huge benefit. It's, it's a hotbed right now, and Larmour couldn't be learning in a better place. Yeah, there's a lot of experience, I think, and that's, that's a really important word, experience, because because these guys have been through the mill, they've been in tough situations, they've won together, lost together. Um, so he can pick up little um, you know, bits of information off them. So he's he's in a great position. Um, and Rob Carney has been an outstanding player for Leinster and Ireland for probably the guts of eight, nine, ten years. So he's he's going to learn a lot from him as well. Um, he won't be kind of thrown in the tr- towel, Rob Carney, too easy and, and allowing him to take his place and giving him too much info. But certainly you learn a lot from these guys around you, yeah, for sure. The one thing I was really impressed with last week was Luke McGrath, who seems to have stepped up to a different level again this year. I know at the start of the season we would have been chatting about who's the backup nine for Ireland. There's no question now it's Luke McGrath. Probably the inclusion of Kieran Marmion in the squad yesterday uh, solidifies Luke, Luke McGrath's position as number two. And some people would have been surprised that John Cooney uh, wasn't included in the squad yesterday instead of Marmion. But just on McGrath, how, how does he make that improvement? I know playing alongside Johnny Sexton, naturally you're going to get better and better with game time. Is that the sole reason for his improvement? I think so, yeah, and a, and a competitive environment, and he obviously has the natural talent, but I think if you look at someone like Conor Murray, his all-round game is outstanding, he's passing, he's running, he's defence, he's kicking game, can Luke McGrath kind of ha- bring that same physicality? He's a, he can't because he's a different player, but his distribution has improved, his decision-making has improved, and he's a real threat with the ball around the breakdown, he's always looking for a gap and opportunity, so they're different players. But as long as Conor Murray's around, unfortunately, it's going to be very difficult unless his game starts to, to, to wane a little bit. But to have that kind of competition, and you think back, Marmion was outstanding last year for, for, for against England. Mm. Absolutely outstanding. And Joe Schmidt doesn't forget that. No. He remembers guys, even if their form is a little bit... He's in the system. So there's no guarantee yeah, that sure. Luke McGrath could, because he's playing so well... He's been out there, he's been in there in, in that environment and played so well, Marmion. So but it is a great, again, good depth there. Uh, an area that wasn't so strong maybe eighteen months ago. Uh Munster, uh, after the losing bonus point in Paris, that means they just have to beat Castle Tomond on Sunday and qualification is assured. They'll do that, right? Yeah, they'll do that. I think um I think there's it's it's a special place to play in and European days, nights. Um so I think uh they look back at Racing with a bit of regret and disappointment. Mm. Discipline, again, has been an issue in the last few weeks. Um, 11 penalties at the weekend. And Why does it become an issue? It's just some poor decision-making under pressure. Uh, penalties come when you're under pressure. Yeah. Um, so it's bad decision-making in the heat of the moment. Um, and it's a collective thing because they're, they're just panicking a little bit. Some of these penalties are very silly ones. Hindmost foot being offside in midfield. Um, gone off your feet at the breakdown and it's costing them because you look at the start of the game um, the other day I think it was they they, they kind of shot themselves in the foot they were under pressure and they panicked a little bit um, and then you think when Conor Murray gets a long wedge penalty this is it what a remarkable comeback performance even with some mistakes and errors throughout the game great character to come back um, the kickoffs cost them as well um, so very they were you know, what could have been an outstanding yeah. victory for him ended up being a losing bonus point. But I think um, Van Gran is only in about eight weeks and I think he's got to take control of this discipline situation and put pressure on the players. Um, so Cast will come all gung-ho on Sunday and if you allow him play and allow him get him into the game and enjoy yeah. themselves, they could be very dangerous. But I think I actually think Munster will get a bonus point win, which will bring him to 21. You're then looking at other results, which is unfortunate for a home quarter final, um, because it could have been so different for him. Um, you're looking at the Toulon Scarlets game. Yeah. You probably want Toulon to uh, let Scarlets to win, but not win with a bonus point. Yeah. And then you're looking at Ulster away to Wasps. You can see the Scarlets Toulon game being 54-48, like the Easily, way they're playing the you know. So unfortunately, they're relying possibly on other results. But look. Um, I think it'd be very disappointing if they're away in a quarter final from their perspective because certainly the cast game and the wrestling game could come back to haunt them. But who knows if they get that the five points on Sunday and have a home quarter final? Happy days. In my opinion, they're in a semi final. It doesn't yeah. matter who's coming to Thomond Park. 
You mentioned we're eight weeks in now to the Van Graan era, and I think it's fair to say that we're starting to notice a bit more of the Van Graan stamp, despite the fact that he does need to eradicate those discipline issues. And there just seems to be more of a basic attacking plan. Like Keith Earls, I thought, has been outstanding yeah. for the last fortnight. Yeah, they've worked. They've obviously... Um, and you've got to give Felix Jones credit for that as well. Yeah. And... Uh, um, he wouldn't have changed a huge amount, but I think he's very diligent. We heard that before he signed uh, about his attention to detail and um, his expansive approach to the game. He hasn't tried to take him away from their direct approach and their kicking game, which has been good. Uh, but they've looked more, they've looked dangerous. There's no doubt about it. They've looked dangerous. They've looked like creating opportunities. And I think they could have scored another couple of tries on, on, on Sunday if they were more accurate. So, um, yeah, I think he's done well. Um, like I said, the discipline is something that... And look, it's kind of like me talking about discipline and penalties. I, I'm the expert on giving away penalties. I was. But um, they have cost them, and I think they've spoken about that themselves. You know, if you look at some of the games that they've, they've struggled in, it's, it's been a factor. A quick word about the um, Ulster situation. Obviously, um, there was enough in their performance last week to suggest that they might be able to dig this out. And if they do then it could turn around the entire team, the entire management group, the entire relationship between the players and the management. It's like so much rides on this match. Yeah, it's huge from, um, they haven't been in, in Europe in three, uh, knockout stage in three years. Um, there's a lot of pressure there. Les Kiss is, is speaking about a week after week. And I think some of the performances have been embarrassing. That first half against, against, uh, against Munster, mm. the Connacht defeat just before Christmas, and there's a lot of pressure up up in, in in up north around, and probably frustration maybe that they haven't been winning trophies with the amount of money they've invested and the players they've had. Yeah. Um, this is a real chance because if you get into knockout stages in Europe, it gives a huge lift to the whole organisation. It's a tough task from going to Wasps. Uh, Wasps losing the Harlequins at the weekend helped. Mo um, my, did it help or I don't did know, it not? I don't know. Yeah, That's it it's like kind of puts Wasps pos out of it. Yeah. But then, will they be trying to bounce back? Or do they uh, put a B team out and go, yeah, look? Like yeah, I think they'll, they'll probably try and bounce back. Um, if they're out of it completely, maybe they'll make some changes. So it's a great opportunity. And I think this is a real kind of uh, defining moment for Les Kiss and the whole group. Because if, they don't, if they're out of Europe again, that pressure mounts yeah. uh, to another level. So it's a great opportunity for them. We've uh, we've got to talk about our power rankings and our depth chart. We've been uh, we've been ranking who we think should start as opposed to who we think will actually start because obviously I think we all have a fair idea who Josh Smith is going to pick if he has um, his full deck to pick from. So here's our power rankings. We're going to start with the blind side. Um, we'll move to open side number eight in a minute. Um, so Peter Amani, I think Jordy Murphy probably would have got an extra couple of um, uh, points up that in recent weeks because he's actually played really well. He's come back into yeah. the team. And actually, I think he, he's kind of come back into the Leinster team in the back of being picked for Ireland by Joe Schmidt. But there's no ifs, ands or buts. It's Peter Romani all day long and twice on Sundays. Yeah, it's Peter Romani at six and that's just the way it is. Reese Ruddock is out. Um, Jamie Heaslip is not there. Sean O'Brien is not there. Um, so it's Romani. Manny will start at six. Yeah, okay. So we can move on to seven. But just on the six situation, yeah. you can play... You can play standard there, you can put Conan at eight, you can play Levy there, Yeah. you can play Jordy Murphy there, Tommy O'Donnell, um, you know, he's more of a seven, but there's a lot of depth there, like when you think of O'Brien, Heaslip, Ruddock, gone, three three big players. Stick the sevens up. Oh, uh, again, I think this looks, I mean, obviously Sean O'Brien would be a 10 if he was fit, right? So that's um, that's just the current situation and the likelihood of him actually uh, starting here. But again, it's Josh van der Fleer with the, the form that he's in at the moment. Joe Schmidt loves him. He's the best tackler in world rugby at the moment. Yeah, van der Fleer started seven, I think, followed closely by, by, by Levy. Probably an impact off the bench. You remember that impact he made in the home game in, in, against Exeter. He was outstanding. Um, again, a lot of depth there with no Sean O'Brien. Yeah. Um, it's incredible. Number eight. CJ with 10 out of 10. It's, I'm interested by these, uh, the, the scorings actually. You made them up. In like a <laughs> I, I did not make these up. I'm, 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 I'm wondering how Peter Matney only got 8 out of 10, <laughs> and Van der Fleer got 9 out of 10, and CJ, well, I suppose CJ is the, the biggest lock of them all, isn't he? Yeah, he's probably. He's a certainty to start. I think O'Mahony, Stander and Van der Fleer are going to be the back row. And who's the sub then? Like, 
do you pick Conan because he can play or he can cover and you can shift or do you, you pick Levy because you want the dynamism? Well, Levy gives you more, more options. Yeah. Um, he probably gives you that option of seven, whereas it depends. If you're playing England, you're probably picking Jack Conan. If you're playing France, it's probably Jack Conan. Maybe, you, maybe a bit of size and physicality. Yeah. He's a big man, Jack Conan. O'Mahony can go to seven um, if, if, if Stander went off. Um, or if, if Van der Fleer went off. So I'm not really sure. It depends probably what happens this weekend. So I think for Paris, it'll, it'll be Conan or Levy on the bench. But your back row will be O'Mahony, Stander and Van der Fleer. Yeah, it's a pretty good back row. Yeah, it is. Like it even is with the injuries. Standing back row. Yeah. The strongest position really when you think about depth and if injuries do happen, it's the one that you're still the most confident in. Absolutely. I think there's... Probably ten or eleven guys that could could seamlessly uh, fit into that system and, and make an impact and do well. Um, all right, Alan, good stuff. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Joe. We, we solved all that. Right? I'm in trouble now. As well. we're, we're safe to go home, are we? Am I in trouble now? You dragged me grand. into your uh, <laughs> your situation. Your grand. Uh, uh, right. So the Keith Andrews Football Show uh, is going to be on from today at half past twelve. Matt Doherty of Wolves and Megan Campbell of Manchester City are on it. Uh, Golf Weekly today. Peter Laurie and. Joe and Nathan, that's from half past one and uh, all available, of course, on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Tonight on off the ball, it is uh, Thursday night, so there'll be some more of the uh, Thursday night football goodness with John Giles. Um, obviously, I suspect he'll talk a good bit about Cyril Regis. He would have had Cyril Regis uh, at West Brom as a manager and uh, you'll also hear some more from Keith Andrews with Nathan a little bit later on as well. But today we're playing out because the GAA <coughs> have announced their brand new halftime show for the spring series in Croke Park. After the uh, Rubber Bandits and Jedward a couple of years ago, they're looking to Cleveland for some inspiration. I just wanna rolly, rolly, rolly with a dab of ranch. I already got some designer to hold on my pants. I just want some ice on my wrist so I look better when I dance. Have you looking at it? Put you in a trance. I just wanna rolly, rolly, rolly with a dab of ranch. I already got some designer to hold on my pants. I just want some ice on my wrist so I look better when I dance. Have you looking at it? Put you in a trance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That way, I need that moolah by Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, that way, I low key feel like Funk Sway. I just now got started, got views on views, I'm popping. My diamonds gone. Yo, girl on deck is a party. I just wanna the Scream Team and their special guest, Tavares Jones, brought to you by Cedar Point.